Well, good evening. Begin to break bread. I've been on the road all day, and I'm in a position where I can't find anything that even looks like wine to break bread with, so I'm going to use a glass of water, remembering that both water and blood came out of the Lord's side when he was pierced. So let's, uh, let's start with a prayer. We're going to be thinking about Genesis chapter 24. That's Abraham wanting to get a wife for his son Isaac. And, of course, we're here not to do a Bible study, but to remember the Lord Jesus above all things. But what we're going to see in that chapter is yet again God's absolute grace, absolute grace to people, absolute grace to Abraham. He's going to be in the kingdom of God, but he was pretty weak. And so was Isaac in some ways, and so was Jacob. But these people are held, are held up as the great examples of people who will be in God's kingdom. So as you look at the cup and at the bread, and you see yourself again bowing before the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, you naturally examine yourself. You naturally ask yourself that question, will I really be saved? Despite God having done all this for me, I'm so weak. Am I really going to be saved? Well, when you look at the, the experience of Abraham and the way that he carried on and the way that he, despite all his weakness, God still loved him and saved him on the basis of his basic, very basic faith in the promises, which are the same gospel of the kingdom that you and I have believed, this is encouraging that through all the dysfunction of our lives, through all the two steps back, and three steps forward, we will get there in the end. And that's the encouragement of Abraham. And it is in that sense, look to Abraham, your father, the rock from whence you were hewn, that in that sense, he is our pattern. So let's start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to these symbols of your dear son, the symbols of your constancy, of your love, of your passionate desire to save us. We come, Father, as sinners, as, as weak people, and we pray, Father, for your patience with us, and that you will maintain our basic faith in you, and that in the end, we shall all come together in that wonderful day when Abraham shall be resurrected, and Isaac and Jacob and inherit the land that you promised them forever. Help us, Father, to realise that we too are strangers and pilgrims in this world. And we bring before you our human needs. Please, Father, be with the people who have been baptised here in Italy recently, the, the migrants. Be, Father, with all those who are trying to preach the gospel in their own obscure ways. Be with Siri and her desire to spread the gospel in Finland. Be with those who have been baptised in cultures which strongly reject your son those struggling with family issues that have arisen from their conversion. Please be with those, Father, who are elderly, those who are losing their mind, those who struggle for every day. We pray, Father, that all of us, whatever level we're at, might look beyond that and look to the wonderful reality of your love and of your kingdom that is to come, and above all to your dear Son and his love and his faithfulness even when we are weak. Father, please do strengthen each and every one of us and help us all and encourage us all through our reflections on Genesis 24 today. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So, Genesis 24, as I said, <clears throat> this is Abraham searching for a wife for Isaac. And I'll say at the start of this that <clears throat> actually the, the line I'm going to take here is different, a different path of interpretation to that which I've come out with in talks that I've given in previous years. It's because the last few days I've been, I've been driving all the time and I've been listening to Genesis 24 and asking myself questions as I, as I listen to it. And I, I've come to this time, this time around, I'm talking about Genesis 24, I've come to some slightly different conclusions to what I have previously. So bear with me. Well, verse one, Abraham was old. And Yahweh had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the elder of his house, who ruled over all that he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I'll make you swear by Yahweh that you will not take a wife for my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I live, but you shall go to my country and to my relatives, that's Mesopotamia, 
Ah, oh, Haran, where he came from. And take a wife from my son Isaac from there. Just stop there. This servant that he had was Eliezer. And in Genesis 15, he says to God, well, what am I going to do? I, I'm childless, and all I've got is this Eliezer of Damascus. This Eliezer is how he calls him, and he's basically going to get everything, isn't he? That's what Abraham says to God in chapter 15. This Eliezer. So he doesn't really like the guy, although he's sort of the manager of everything. Well, Yahweh had blessed Abraham indeed in all things, and all things were under Eliezer. But don't forget, Abraham had 318 servants, we're told. He was a wealthy guy. He was one of the most powerful people in Canaan at that time. And all things were under Eliezer. But now he'd had Isaac, we're going to read in chapter 25, that although Abraham had had some other sons, he'd pushed them off, sent them far away, given them a bit of cash, and he'd given all that he had, all things, to Isaac. But they were managed, the all things were managed, by Eliezer. Well, if Isaac didn't have any offspring, all that vast wealth was going to go to Eliezer. That's what, God, that's what Abraham says in Genesis 15. He's going to get it all, isn't he? If I don't have a son. Well, yes, and also if that son Isaac didn't reproduce, well, yeah, it's all going to be these billions or whatever, in, in our terms, would, would be lost. So Eliezer, I reckon, has got a bit of a vested interest in getting Isaac married off at least within his own family, not to some stranger. When Eliezer talks about Yahweh, he talks about the God of my master Abraham. I'm going to suggest that although he does a couple of times fall on his face because he's blown away by providence and he praises God, I, I'm don't, I don't think that he was a per se believer because he always talks about the God of my master rather than his own God. We'll, uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. I'm just mentioning that at this point. Well, you come here to this... Uh, thing where, where he says, go and get a wife for my son from where I came from, from my country and from my relatives. And Eliezer says to Abraham, but what if the woman isn't willing to follow me? Must I bring your son again to the land where you came from? Abraham says, no, beware that you don't do that. And if the woman isn't willing to follow you, he says, then you shall be clear from this my oath only, and he repeats it twice, don't bring my son back to where I came from. And so Eliezer swears, promises him, and takes ten camels uh, with a whole load of expensive presents on them and goes off to Mesopotamia, verse 10, to the city of Nahor. Well, let's just think about that a little bit. God had told Abraham to leave his family and then he would get a seed that would last forever and to leave his homeland and go to another land, Canaan, which God would give him forever. But Abraham's very slow and unwilling to fulfil those conditions because he doesn't immediately leave his family. When he leaves Ur, it's because his father takes him, and they go and live together in Haran for 20-something years. So he doesn't break very willingly from his homeland when God asks him to, and only when his father's dead does he move on to Canaan, and even that could have been because there was war in that area and everybody was tending to move west anyway. And he certainly doesn't split from his family. For one thing, he doesn't split from his father. God told him in Ur to leave his family, but he doesn't. He doesn't leave his dad. He goes with his dad. He doesn't leave Lot, his nephew. He takes him with him. And also he doesn't leave his half-sister, Sarah. He marries her. 
I would have thought that the command to break with your family meant breaking with your half-sister and certainly not marrying your half-sister. That's a very really weird thing to do. He doesn't do that. He doesn't break with his dad. He only breaks with his dad when his dad dies. And he doesn't really break with Lot. He only breaks with Lot when Lot gets wealthy and sort of says, look, we've, we've got so many animals, the land can't bear us. And Abraham says, well, if you want to go on your own, you can. Okay, he says, yeah, I'll go. So... <laughs> All the time, Abraham is not really trying to obey the conditions he's given in order to get the fulfillment of the seed and of the land. But God coaxes him along, just like us, coaxed along all the time, dragged, kicking and screaming, it seems. And when he sends Eliezer off, he says, The God who made me wander from my father's house will find you a girl for my son Isaac to marry. God made me wonder. Actually, Stephen picks this up in Acts 7 when he says that God removed Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees and Mesopotamia and took him to Canaan. But he was supposed to do that on his own initiative, but he didn't. God made me wander from my father's house, he says. Absolutely. God made him do it. And so you see this as well in our own lives, that, yeah, God's not going to force you, but he loves you and he wants you in his kingdom. And don't think that God is distant from you. God is coaxing you and encouraging you all the way. Yes, he's given you conditions to fulfill, but he's trying to pretty well fulfill them for you. He's so eager for you. Do not think that God is distant, that God is, you know, look, here it is, guys, I've I've given you my son, I've given you my word, I've given you the hope of eternity, now it's, it's your turn. It's over to you to respond. Yes, it is like that. But he keeps trying to get you to do that. And that's what he did with Abraham, because he wants you to say yes. This is the lover who wants the beloved to, to say yes, and is trying every which way to persuade. And this is God's love for you and me. And you, you see that above all in the death of Jesus, which in one hand was not necessary if God wanted to just save us, save anyone, any time, any condition, any basis from which he wants. But he so wanted that we should get it and be saved, that he commended his love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Quite rightly do we remember the Lord's death for us because it is God's desperate almost persuasion of you and me to believe. Well, here I think you have another example of where he doesn't want to break from his family as he should, nor from his homeland, because he says, go back to my country and my relatives. Wait a minute, Abraham, you're supposed to have separated from them. And actually God alludes to this and twists it all around in Genesis 31 when God actually tells Jacob to return to your country and your family. That's when Jacob was living in Mesopotamia. He had gone there to find himself a wife and a run away from his brother Esau and he's living there, marries two women, his relatives, <clears throat> from, uh, uh, from Mesopotamia. But then God says, no, Jacob, go back to your country and go back to your family. So your country, Jacob, is Canaan. Your family is the family in Canaan. But Abraham puts it the other way around. He says to Eliezer, go to my country, Mesopotamia, and to my family. Well, I previously have seen this rather positively because I have always assumed that Abraham did this because he wanted Isaac to, to marry another believer. No. Suddenly the penny dropped. That no, these people back there in what is called the city of Nahor were idolaters, absolute idolaters. We're told that at the end of Joshua 24 that Abraham's family were idolaters. And so was Nahor, Abraham's brother. And he tells his servant to go to the city of Nahor, 
and find a wife from there. Well, don't tell me that was because, oh yeah, they're, they're wonderful, you know, true believers, not idolaters. Like the Canaanites, they were idolaters. And you see this later on when, when Jacob does what he shouldn't have done, which is to go back there to get married. And he marries Rachel and Leah. And I mean, Rachel is a big time idolater. I mean, both of them name their kids, basically, with allusion at times to idols. And Rachel is so hooked on idols that she steals her father's idols when they have to leave. And risks her life, and risks the life of all of them, really, by stealing them. She can't live without her idols. Rachel, who knows? She steals Laban's idols. So, no. The idea of... Eliezer, go back to my country and my relis and find a wife for my son, Isaac, was not because they weren't idolaters. No. All the evidence in the Bible is that they were idolaters. Uh, you see this uh, in, in, again in Genesis 31, when Laban swears by the gods of Nahor and in contradistinction to swearing by the God of Abraham. So these people definitely were idolaters. And there's something else. It is wrong to say that there was no one in Canaan who believed in Yahweh. And that Eliezer had to go and get uh, a non-idolater out of Mesopotamia, out of the city of Nahor, idolater, uh, from the family of Laban, who were idolaters, uh, th th when there were believers in Canaan. Why do I say there were believers in Canaan? Melchizedek, king of Jerusalem and priest of the Most High God. Well, if he was a priest of the Most High God who blessed Abraham, well, he was a believer. And if he was a priest, that implies there was a community for whom he was a priest. There were believers in Jerusalem, and Melchizedek was their priest. Consider how great this man was, Hebrews says. So there were believers, and they weren't in Mesopotamia. They were there pretty much on Abraham's doorstep. Oh, no, he didn't want them. No, no, no. You go and get from my country and my relatives. You're not supposed to talk about Mesopotamia as your country, Abraham. And your family, no, no, you're supposed to split from them. And all the time you see this, Isaac marries into his own family, the family from Mesopotamia. And what happens? Rebecca's barren for 20 years. Jacob does the same, goes back there, marries Rachel and Leah, and all manner of problems with fertility all over again. Why all these fertility problems? Well, that goes to the territory if you keep marrying your relatives time and again over the generations. Well, it's not rocket science to figure that. So this family, the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob family, who were set up as you know the, the founders of God's people, I mean, they were mixed up big time, very big time. I'm not knocking Abraham. I'm not knocking them. You're mixed up. I'm mixed up. You know? And yet we believe, and it is in that sense, it is in that sense that Abraham is our pattern because he held on. Sure, there were flashes of brilliance when he you know, was willing to offer Isaac. Definitely. Uh, no question. God was well pleased with him. Quite rightly so. Same with you and me. We're flashes of brilliance. But uh, really and truly, Abraham is our pattern all the way through. So he doesn't really want to separate, does he, from his, his land and from his family. But they were the conditions for him to receive the promises. He frets against it and tries to wriggle around it. But as God is you know, tolerating him and beckoning him on. You know, sometimes on one hand, you can say that, look, God is going to pretty well save anyone who says yes. He's so enthusiastic for our salvation. On the other hand, there is the God who kills Uzzah because he put his hand out to steady the ark. And so he's killed, because he's not supposed to touch the ark. There is the God who smites down Ananias and Sapphira for lying about or exaggerating their generosity to him. 
and the God who will be sanctified in them who draw nigh unto him. Those two signs, I don't believe, are resoluble, not by any intellectual process, not by some smart book that's written or some meme or something like that, not at all. And I think that's intentional. And so it, so it has to be, really, in human life, that we as sinners who are saved by grace must on one hand see that God is absolutely passionate to save us and we believe he will save us. But on the other hand, God is very demanding, absolutely demanding, and quite rightly so. And his holiness will not be infringed. And that is left, I think, as an intentional paradox in human life, that we might get it and, and feel that paradox. And there is, a, I don't think, any resolution of it. As I say, not by some quick intellectual process. There isn't. Right, so then, <clears throat> this Eliezer goes off. And as I say, I said at the start, I think he had his own sort of agenda that he had all that Abraham had was under him. But all that Abraham had had been given to Isaac. And, well, if only Eliezer could get Isaac to marry into his family, all these billions, which is effectively what Abraham had, as it were, would go into his family. Well, he is sceptical, isn't he? Eliezer is a bit sceptical at the start of it. He said, but what if the woman isn't willing to follow me? Well, Abraham said, well, then you'll be clear from this my oath. And I think, you know, there is no contingency plan on Abraham's side. And that may be a positive thing in Abraham. I think he's saying, look, he's, Isaac has got to marry. Um, but, well, OK, if he's not going to marry and reproduce, well, I don't know how the promises are going to be fulfilled through him, but they will be. Rather like he learned in Genesis 22, go and offer your, your son Isaac, the child of promise, offer him, sacrifice him. And how the promise is going to be fulfilled? Well, he just accepted somehow they would be. So, you know, I'm not doing Abraham down. I mean, there there is this faith, this just... When you're up against a brick wall to just say, I do not understand, and we live in a world that is crazy on understanding, well, you can't understand everything, and trust. You see, faith means trust, as I keep saying. That is what the Hebrew word means, is what the Greek word means. This is what it is to believe. It is to trust. And if you want to see it all vis visibly, visually evidenced in front of you, and if you think you've got all the answers to everything, well, where's the trust? Where is the, the jump into the unknown? So, <clears throat> Isaac, by the way, does send his son Jacob back to Mesopotamia to find a wife. So, although Abraham said, oh, I don't want my son Isaac to do that, he said, well, yeah, but you go, Eliezer, and you find him a wife, but bring the wife from there, here. Well, that was a weakness, and I think that Isaac sort of repeated it by sending Jacob there. And as I say, Jacob's marriage to Rachel and Leah was pretty well disastrous. Uh, but out of it, God built the, the 12 tribes of Israel. There's no, no doubt about that at all. So off Eliezer goes, and he gets there. And he says... And I don't think this is a prayer. It's not called a prayer. This is in verse 12. He said, rather than prayed, Okay, Yahweh, um, if a, a woman comes along, a girl comes along, and I, uh, and, uh, I ask her for something to drink, if she says yes, and I will give your camel's drink also, may that be the woman for Isaac. In verse 45, when he um, recounts to Laban what had happened at the well, he said, before I had done speaking to my heart. He said this within his own mind. He says 45 in the Hebrew, certainly, before I had done speaking to my heart, to myself. This wasn't a prayer to God. 
This was him saying to his own heart, we're told in verse 45, well, okay, Yahweh, if, uh, if this girl should say, yes, I'll give you a drink and I will draw waters for your camels, well, okay, let her be the one then. Because no girl was going to do that. There was a line, there's always a line at wells. And ten camels, to water them was hours of work. You know, this is 1,500 litres of water with a bucket and pitcher. This is, a, <laughs> this is putting a, up a hoop for God that is surely is not going to come true. Because Eliezer wants the outcome to be negative. He wants to come back to Abraham and say, yep, no deal. No, nope, didn't get anyone. So he can get Isaac married off on his own agenda. Don't forget, Eliezer was from Damascus. And Abraham was concerned Isaac should not marry a Canaanite. Well, Eliezer was not technically in that sense a Canaanite. He was from Damascus. So, he sets up this impossible thing, and all through this story, Rebecca is the heroine, because she upstages him. He's said in his heart, well, pff, come on, Yahweh, then, if you want to find a, a wife for uh, this Isaac, okay, may it be, then, that the, uh, the girl who comes uh, offers me a drink and offers to draw water for my camels, because no girl's ever going to do that, and it's going to make a great backlog at the well, it's going to be very awkward for her to do that. Well, we're told in verse 21 that Eliezer watched her silently to find out whether or not the Lord had given him success. He watched her, it didn't help her by the way, he watched her, this was over a period of hours, to get all that water for ten camels. He watched her. How else is that Hebrew word translated? Isaiah 6 verse 11, if you want to check it out. The same Hebrew word is used about cities being left waste and desolate. Shouldn't he have been jumping up in joy? Jumping up and down in joy saying, oh wow, thank you Yahweh, yeah. But instead, he watches her for a couple of hours, watching being the same word for waste and desolate. He's desolated because he's given God in his own mind this kind of test and, well, it comes true. And he does sort of fall over and say, well, wow, you know, uh, I must admit, <laughs> God of my master, you took my breath away there. But then what does he do? When she's finished, he offers her these expensive golden nose rings. Now, golden nose rings, as you learn from Ezekiel 16, were a sign of betrothal. And this was before, before he asks her, in verse 23, what family she's from. You can read all this too quickly, but when you're driving up and down the motorways, like I've been doing for a few days, you start asking yourself questions. And this is how to study the Bible. Ask yourself questions. In those days, very few people had a camel. Everyone travelled by foot or by donkey. And to have ten camels, I mean, this is royalty. And the, the gifts that he gives are worth a fortune. She accepts the nose rings, which were the sign of betrothal. And that again upstaged him, because, in my opinion, he's just a random guy who's turned up at the well, and there's this lower social class girl who's drawing the water. Drawing water was a servant's work, and obviously didn't have um, a servant to do it, and the girl was doing it for the family. And I oh know they did, she did have a nurse, uh, uh, etc., but I don't think that 
they were wealthy, but she wouldn't have been drawing water. And this guy, Eliezer, turns up with these ten camels and these huge uh, wealthy gifts and says, hey, you know, do you want to get betrothed? Do you want to marry? Uh, you know, my master's son back far, far away. If you want, do you want to, if you want to do it, I, I'll give you the sign of betrothal. And she says, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah I'll accept them. Her acceptance of the nose rings is huge. And only after that does he say, oh, by the way, what, what family are you from? Oh, well, Abraham's family. <laughs> God definitely is in this. I'm suggesting all the way through that he is trying to elicit no for an answer. He's trying to bring this to no deal. Locking up in ten camels, with ten camels, is like turning up in some small town with uh, ten brand new Mercedes. And there's a girl there, uh, well, say at the well, or, or let's say she's uh, standing there selling, uh, selling hot dogs or something. And this guy goes up to her and starts offering her diamond rings. If you, if you get in my Mercedes and I'm going to drive you, uh, you know, a thousand or more, a couple of thousand kilometers, a thousand kilometers, let's say, and you're going to marry someone. <laughs> no decent girl is going to say yes. Now, Rebecca was a decent girl. But she says yes. Okay, I'll accept the nose rings. I'll accept the betrothal. He was expecting her to say, oh, no, I couldn't ex accept uh, a betrothal to somebody. You must come and talk to my parents. You must come to my home. I, I, I can't just agree to this. I can't agree to get betrothed uh, just myself, let alone just standing at a well with a, a stranger. But she says yes. And that up, upstages him. Well, don't forget, in the East, uh, particularly in those days, everything was done very slowly. But he then goes with her to the family home. In verse 33, if you look at any textual commentary, you'll see that there's a bit of a problem with the Hebrew text. The, all the translations, English translations, say food was set before him, that's Eliezer, to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I've told you my message. The Hebrew, and the Septuagint actually supports it, says that Eliezer, <clears throat> Eliezer put food before them to eat. Now, this is an absolute affront to hospitality. You went to someone's house and they entertained you. You did not walk in there and set them up with food and stuff like that yourself. You just didn't do that. And of course, first of all, you have a meal and then you talk. But he says, no, you've got to decide this immediately. And he dangles the presents. They're all sort of on the camels and all that. Um, you've got to say yes before we eat. No decent family is going to say yes to that. Some fellow rocks up with ten Mercedes and says, uh, oh, can I have your, your daughter or your unmarried sister uh, to marry my, my boss's uh, son? Uh, and you've got to say yes. And if you do, well, it's diamond rings worth a hundred thousand euros for you. If you don't want it, he says, just if, you, if you're not going to agree, then I'm leaving. I shall turn to the right or to the left, he said. In other words, I'll make it my own choice you got the choice, I put it in front of you, you want to say yes or no? He's setting them up to say, look, wait a minute. No, if you're saying that we've got to say yes before you even eat a meal with us, and you've barged in anyway to our property and start, you know, putting food on our table, look, stop. I can see why Laban said yes, because we know from his later history with, with Jacob that he was avaricious, that is, that he was he was a materialist, and when he saw, you know, you know, 100,000 euro diamond rings being flashed around, do you want this, do you want that? He was like, oh, yes, please. Um, it didn't do him much good, by the way, because it's later on, it, his own daughters uh, are still having to feed, uh, having to water their own flocks, so it didn't go too well. But anyway, yeah, that's why he said yes. 
But even though everything is stacked really against Eliezer, that really has to accept really that God, well, is kind of, uh, well, wants this marriage to happen. Well, they then set it up that, well, you know, even Laban, with the flash of the diamond rings in his eyes, is a little bit leery about, about all this. And eventually he says, and Eliezer agrees, let's bring the girl and let's see what she says. You know, do you want to go immediately, this minute now, to a land you've never been to, far, far away, with this guy with his ten camels, with his fleet of Mercedes, who's flashing diamond rings around, and marry a man you've never known? You know, for all she knew, Isaac might be handicapped. He might be a nutcase. He might already have ten wives. He might be, uh, you know, he might have killed the last five of them. Um, you know, he might be a nutcase. And when they say to her, look, do you want to stay for a bit before you go? And Eliezer saying, no, if she wants to stay for a bit before she goes, no deal. He keeps on trying to get a no deal out of this. And so they say, okay, let's bring her in. Well, what is any decent girl? And she was a decent girl. What is any decent girl going to say? She's going to surely not just agree. And she says, I will go. And I will go right, right away. Okay, Eliezer says, well, let's have the meal and let's be gone. Rebecca is the heroine, quite exactly why she agreed and the way she did all the way through, accepting the nose rings, saying she was going to go straight away. You could say maybe because she perceived the hand of God was in all this, or maybe she just wanted to get out of, the, of a, an abusive situation with her brother Laban, that's possible. Or maybe God just made her say yes. We've all said yes at times to things that afterwards you think, oh, what was, what was I thinking? Say yes to that. Um, but, you know, maybe that's how she was. Whatever. The takeaway lesson from all this is that with Eliezer trying desperately to stop this happening, it happened. Because the hand of God was definitely by grace in it. Because God wanted this woman to marry Isaac, it was a marriage made in heaven, and all the best laid plans of mice and men, people like Eliezer, <clears throat> came to nothing. And there you see the similarity with how God had taken Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, out of Haran, made him separate from his homeland, separate from his family in order to fulfill his promises to him. And it is the same here, all the way through. I start off by saying that we're here not to particularly do a Bible study on Genesis 24, but to remember Jesus. And here, here's the relevance, you see, that when you look at our own lives, who am I? Who am I that I should be saved? Who am I that I should be in God's kingdom? Who am I? You know, God has given us conditions, and we are very slow to, to obey them. We make excuses, we've got our own little agendas, and we have other people like Eliezer in our lives who got their agendas for us. And through it all, God is working because he wants to save us. You know, one of the characteristics of the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob family, I would say, Simply that, that God, by his grace, predestinated them. You know, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated, uh, and so on. And that he had a number on them. Now, if you say to me, well, how do I know that God's got this sort of number on me? Because you're here. Most people on this planet never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you did, and so did I. If you hear the gospel, you are called. Don't scratch your head wondering if you're called. If you hear the gospel, you're called. If I say I invite you to my flat tomorrow night at five o'clock in the evening, well, don't tell me you didn't hear the invitation. I just gave it to you. You heard. Don't 
pretend you, you're deaf or you didn't get me or something like that. You, you heard, I invited you. And so it is with, with the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. You and I have been called. God has got a number on you and me. And especially when you look at the cross of Jesus, it is a bit of a mystery in a sense that he died for you personally and he died for me personally. And for Paul, who could say the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah, it is hard to get your head around, but it is true. And the more you think about the, the cross of Jesus, the crucifixion, and the more you try to reenact it in your own mind, as it might have been, the more you try to reconstruct it, and you see him there, and the, the bread and the cup are, are there to help us. I mean, they're just you know, helping us to, to get sort of focused. That's all they are in that sense. That helps to focus. Then you start to get it. That he did this for me. He died for me. Again, as Paul says, the just for the unjust. That he might bring me to God and to the everlasting life. And when you look at this incident here in Genesis 24 of, of God's absolutely sovereign hand in the life of his children, through all their dysfunction, through all their weakness, you and me are the children of Abraham. We are his seed, big time. Not just because we were baptized, but because we are so similar. And as you look back in your life, you see this sovereign hand of God. That not, it is not of him who wills, not of him who runs, Paul says, but of God who shows mercy. And that is absolutely how it is. And the fact that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. This is what we're here to remember. Let's try to give thanks. Heavenly Father, how can we thank you enough for your gracious hand in my life and that you brought us to know your Son and to realise that you have a special interest in me and that he died for me. Thank you, Heavenly Father, and thank you, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we take this cup as the symbol of the communion, of the fellowship, of our part in the blood and the life of your dear Son. Father, let us tell you straight, we earnestly want to be part of him and of his life and his death and his eternity. But we are weak and have, have made so many poor decisions and have been so slow in our response to you over the years of our lives. Heavenly Father, please buck us up and help us in the days that remain that we might truly be devoted to him, to his life, to his death and to his cause and that we might respond more quickly to your loving hand in our lives for his sake.